Well, what's going on, Lake people? Lake people, L-A-K-E. Good to see you guys today. It is Labor Day weekend. We're so glad that you're here. Let's jump right into the Word of God. I found the title Lake People very fitting given the fact that this is Labor Day weekend. We don't live near an ocean, so the lake is the next best option. I'm willing to bet there are probably people watching the live stream late right now on the lake, right? And all those people, welcome. This morning, though, we're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 8. And in Luke chapter 8, what we're going to see is Jesus is going on a lake trip. And on this lake trip, Jesus is going to encounter three groups of people. And each group gives him a different response to him being there. You could say that they were responding to the glory of Jesus. We will examine how they respond, then look at our own hearts and see, are we fitting into this equation properly? How am I responding to the glory of the Father? But before I jump into lake people, I first want to start off with a scripture. It is Luke chapter 8, verse 18. It's talking. Check. We good? What if that was the entire message? differently would you listen to how I spoke? Would you lean in a little more? Would you lean in because the voice of God often doesn't come how we expect it to. It's not always this booming voice. He wants you to lean in for the small whisper today. Luke 8 verse 18. Pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. I read this and I'm hooked, man. I'm gone. I'm just so into this verse. Did you catch what he said? He said, how you listen. I look across this room and everybody has two ears, I hope. Maybe you got one slashed off, I don't know. You all two ears, one nose, two eyes, two hands. You only hear through your ears. But Jesus didn't say pay attention to what you hear. He said how you hear. Jesus, we only hear through our ears, so what are you talking about right now? Well, let's look at what the Passion Translation says. Jesus says pay careful attention. This is the exact same verse. Pay careful attention to your hearts as you listen to my teaching. For those who have open hearts, even more revelation will be given to them until it overflows. Do you see it is the ear that allows sound to enter, but it is your heart that truly hears. And so can we come today to this place and say, God, here I am, an open heart. Whatever you want to speak, I want to receive. Whatever you have is far better than what I know, right? But if I come to church or I come in my approach with Jesus with open ears, but a clogged heart, I'm only going to leave understanding what I already knew in the first place. But God is in the business of pouring out the new. There's new insight and wisdom and love that he wants to extend to you this morning. So I have open hearts to receive. I am here this morning to completely disrupt any form of comfort you may be experiencing. I'll just be clear with you all. I was talking to my wife last night, and we're just so comfortable and I am so tired of it because the word of God is alive and active yet we treat it as if it's some type of thing to give me a cute verse when I feel sad when this is a relational piece to which how he wants to speak to me so I have this feeling this morning where I can be completely free in the spirit and so this may look differently than how I normally preach and so Scott you have a word right now and I want you to pray over this message right now Scott would you please pray for open hearts as we do this Father, we just come before you this morning, Father. We just ask that you open each heart here, Father, that you just give us um, great understanding and great wisdom as Garrett preaches this word, Father. For we know that it is not Garrett preaching. He's just the vessel and that the Holy Spirit is speaking through him, Father. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you guys all better pay attention now because you don't know when I'm coming to you. Don't fall asleep. This thing's knocking on your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> the title of this message is Lake People. And you guys know what I love to do. I really love to go on trips. Like anyone else like to go away? Like even if it's just for a week. And I just like to see something new sometimes. And I really love getting invited to go on a trip. Have you ever been invited to go somewhere? Oh, that's so much fun. Except for when what you expected to happen is not what took place, right? Your expectation was excitement, but you got there and like, oh, this is really weird. This was not what I expected. And so last summer, July of 2020, right, we're in Colorado, and we're hiking. And we met up with the Jackson family for a couple of days. And if you know the Jacksons, you can say, Garrett, stop right there. I know where this is heading, right? 
Casey says, I found this hiking trail. Casey, you remember, he said, I found this hiking trail. It's really cool. It's two and a half miles. And at the top of this trail, there's a body of water that kids can swim in it. And so we did this trail. It was really cool. Here's a picture of uh, there's Parker and Abel. And we were swimming in this. I didn't swim. But they were swimming in this body of water. It was really cool. Everything was going great, just how we expected, until a girl screamed one word. This girl comes out of the water frantically, leeches, leeches. And we're like, oh, no, the kids are running out, leeches over their legs, in between their toes. The boys are checking their privates just to be safe, right? Everyone's concerned in this moment. This water that was pretty was infested with leeches. It was not what we expected. Jesus has invited his friends to go on a lake trip. The disciples are pumped up. But what they discover is this lake trip with Jesus is not how we thought it would go down. You guys know Peter in the Bible? I think Peter was so excited. Peter strikes me as somebody who's down for spontaneous lake trips. Jesus, what a good idea. Let's go on a lake trip. You know the fishermen, they had their gear loaded. They're ready to go. Can you picture this? A lake trip with Jesus. Good times. Great weather. I bet he has food prepared. Man, it's a biblical cruise. Luke 8, check this out. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. And I bet the disciples were like, Jesus, you rest. You rest. We got this. We have so many fun activities planned for you, Jesus. You take a nap. But soon, I bet he slept five minutes. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. This is not a point in my message, but this is now a point in the message. When you're reading the Bible on your own, I want you to begin to read the words that describe the tone of voice to which they are using when they speak. Do we notice it said, shouting, exclamation point, after the word drown. It wasn't Master, Master, it was Master. Master, we're going to drown. I bet you they had tears in their eyes, the scared ones. They really thought they were going to die in this moment. Can we grip the reality of what's taking place? The boat has water in it, and they are going to die. This lake trip has turned dangerous. This biblical cruise is not going how they thought. Jesus is able to rest despite the circumstance because Jesus is aware of who is in control of every situation. When we're in a storm, we've got to learn to focus who is in control of every situation. You see, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. Right, fellas? You can ask your wife, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You know she's not fine. When she says, oh, I'm fine, and walks away, right? Or you can ask someone, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, man, I'm doing great. They said the same thing, but what they communicated was completely different. The tone of voice to which you speak matters. I want to apply this in your approach with Jesus. How you speak to Jesus matters. Your prayer life and how you pray matters. Because if you go into the secret place with stress and you leave with stress, you weren't praying. You were probably just complaining. The tone of voice to which we speak is impactful because how you talk is a direct reflection of what's within your heart. Are you thanking God on credit? I'm talking about are you thanking God in advance for what's going to happen or are you complaining about the current battle? We have something the disciples did not possess on that boat. We've got the Bible. We have the word of God. Because we have the word of God, we know how every single thing ends out, right? Victory. Jesus is victory. So why are we worried about the waves whenever the one who's in control of all holds me within his hand? We have this. Don't focus on the storm. Focus on the Savior. Get in the word and fill yourself up with him. See, Jesus came through for Moses and Joshua and everyone else. So he's going to come through for you. You guys know how quiet it is after a storm, right? It's like that eerie, quiet feeling that comes across. I can just imagine Jesus has just calmed this terrible storm. You could probably hear a pin drop on that thing. Look at the words Jesus speaks next, verse 25. Then he asked them, where is your faith? Woo. I bet you they're all silent, like no one said a word. Where is your faith, Peter? Where is your faith, John? Where is your faith at, people on the boat? 
Where's your faith at, Lake People, at Lifeway Church this morning? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? I don't know. Jesus knows where they're located, but in this moment, he's questioning the location of their faith. That's scary. I don't want Jesus to ever question the location of my faith. We've gotten to this point to where we've got to learn to understand that Jesus is on the boat. Can you guys see this? What if everyone else got stressed out? What if everyone else stayed offended? What if everyone else was worried, but you learned to go take a nap by the person who was resting? That's peace. He is peace. But if you continue to focus on the wave, then you'll be tossed to and fro. But Jesus wants to settle you in the middle of the storm. You see, King, King David got this. David lived this. Psalm 23, 5. David said, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. I think a lot of us have heard that verse but have been unable to apply it to your life because we continue to pray for power and strength to get through the battle. Jesus, get me through this. No, no, no. He has a feast for you in the middle of it. This type of faith on your part will open up a door for you to witness to somebody at a level you could not previously. You're thinking, how is that possible? How can I witness differently? Because if you can stay steadfast despite the trouble in your own life, Despite your financial situation, you're still generous, right? Despite how others treat you, you're still loving. People will wonder, how do they do that? How do they love like that? Do people think that about us as a church? You know, how does Lifeway love like that? How do they serve their community like that? How are they the way that they are? This is your opportunity to tell them, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Let's continue with this passage. They've ended the boat trip. They've docked on the other side, and I imagine Matthew's very relieved. Matthew is the tax collector of the group, right, and he's the money guy. I bet you Matthew wasn't in too many storms. I bet he's so relieved. Oh, finally, we're on solid ground, right? He feels so good. But Matthew, hold on. It's about to get crazy. Check this out. Verse 27. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat. Catch all these details in this story. The Bible is amazing. As Jesus was climbing out. A man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. Can you visualize this? The boat has docked. And as he's climbing out, he's got one foot out. A naked, demon-possessed man is running at him. If I'm Jesus, that leg, that leg is going back in the boat. Peter, pull up the anchor. We're back on this lake, right? I don't want any part of that lake community. That place is wild. No chill. If you have kids that get crazy, sometimes parents, you say, no chill. These kids have no chill. Jesus got no chill on another level. He can't take a nap for five minutes. He's being yelled at. He can't comfortably climb out of a boat. He's being chased down by a naked, demon-possessed man. It sounds like to me, Jesus just pulled up at Dollar General in Midwest City. Okay, let's get back into this. Verse 28. As soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Please, I beg you. Don't torture me. Wow. You guys know what happens next. Jesus cast out the demons into a herd of pigs. The herd of pigs jumps over the cliff and they drown in the lake Jesus was just in, right? But this message isn't about the miracle. This message is about the lake people. And so the lake community pulls up on the scene because they've heard all this commotion. People rushed out to see what had happened. This is great news. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet. Sounds beautiful. He's fully clothed. Thank God he's got clothes on now. And he's perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. That last line doesn't make sense to me because everything above that sounds pretty good. They're afraid. Why are you afraid of a guy with clothes on sitting at the feet of Jesus full of peace? Shouldn't they have been afraid whenever he was terrorizing their town, right? Living in the cemetery, breaking out of the chains they tried to restrain him in. Why are they afraid now that he is normal? I was talking to my friend about this verse. And he said something so deep to me. He said, maybe to those people, that guy being crazy, maybe that was normal to them. Maybe they didn't like the fact that he was healed and set free. What in our life is so out of order, but it's been that way for so long, we've identified it as normal? 
Would you get uncomfortable if Jesus touched that spot, if he healed that family member, if the generational iniquity was completely broken in an instant? Would it make you feel weird? This late community, they don't want it. No part of it. Then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And all the people in the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Leave us alone, Jesus. Get out of here. You're making my life uncomfortable, Jesus. Go away. For a great wave of fear swept over them. And so Jesus got on the boat and he left. Point number two for lake people is control. Write it down, control. Back to the beginning of Luke chapter 8, this community of people, they can't hear or they can't see. Remember, we talked about how we hear. It's not what you hear, it's how you hear. It's with an open heart. Clearly they had eyes to see. Clearly they saw the man who was demon-possessed set free. No, 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 they don't see that. They see this guy is disrupting my way of life. This guy has thrown all my pigs, my money into the lake. This guy's messed up what's going on. Whew. The one who has arrived with the power and authority to restore a man's life is now in the picture. Get out of here, Jesus. You have to wonder what did they miss out on because they asked Jesus to leave. Have you ever done that? What have we missed out on because we asked Jesus to leave? Because for a lot of us, our life wasn't Jesus came into my heart and set me free. It was I gave my life to Jesus, and then I kind of wandered around, and I tried to do the right thing, but I kept messing up. And we keep going through these little veins of in and out of the Father, but we have not really fully surrendered. And we do this for some time, and what did we miss? What did we miss? Before we judge the people of Gerasenes and say, how dare they tell Jesus to get out? I think it would be wise of us to understand that we, too, often push away people or things that we can't understand or that we can't control. I don't understand how Jesus healed that man. I can't explain what took place. And so, Jesus, it would be better if you got out of here. Check this out, 2 Corinthians 5.14. I love this verse. Either way, Christ's love controls us. That's a good verse. This verse should run your life. Let the love of Christ control you. I feel like the word control has this type of pushback with it. Just saying control is uncomfortable. But if you'll let the love of Christ control you, you are in the perfect place to release his kingdom. Check this out, soon echo. This is the word Paul uses when he writes the word control. This means to hold together or grip tightly. Take a picture of that if you want to. Get that written down. This is very important. Soon echo. God's hand has a tight grip on your family. Somebody needs to hear this. God's hand has a tight grip over your health. God's hand has a tight grip over your finances. Don't let the enemy steal what is in the hand of God. Let him control your life. The love of Christ controls me. Ooh, what a powerful word. Get this. Suneko is found in 2 Corinthians 5.14, but Suneko is also found in Luke 8.37 to describe this. The people of Gerasenes, for a great sense of fear swept over them. There was a Suneko hold on the people of Gerasenes, but it wasn't the Suneko hold of Christ. It was a Suneko hold of fear. What has a Suneco hold over your life? Because I promise you, you're not in control. Oh, you think you're in control. You're not in control. Something is compelling you. Something is controlling you. And if it's not the hand of God, then it's opinions. Then it's applause. Then it's performance. Something's controlling the way that you live. And if it's not the hand of God, then I'm sorry, brother and sister. You might be twisted up. But the hand of God is coming through to unravel the things within you that are unresolved. He's here in this place, and he's come to mess with the lake people, to shift their priorities. Do I have the right environment for Jesus to move in my heart? Examine myself every single day. We've got to examine ourselves every single day. Every day. Not just Sundays, but every day, even when I mess up and even when I do good. God, examine me. Look through my heart and fix what doesn't belong, Lord. I'll be blunt. I don't like controlling people. 
right? Raise your hand if you like controlling people. That's what I thought. Nobody likes controlling people, right? They're always trying to dictate the conversation. They're always trying to push their agenda. It's not a great personality trait. If you don't want to have this personality trait within you, well, then let his love control you. Man, you see things differently, and you love differently. You can't help yourself. Why? Because the hand of God has a suneco hold on you, and today he wants to grip you tighter. Point number three is waiting. Write this down. Waiting. Okay. So Jesus and the disciples have been kicked out of garrisons. They've gotten back onto the boat, and they're going to the other side of the lake. And I wonder if the disciples are trying to pump themselves up, like, quietly. Have you ever messed up? Have you ever, like, messed up and you know you got to go back and do it the next day? Right? You got this, Peter. You don't care how big the waves are, Peter. You are tough. You're strong, right? He's just psyching himself up. He's ready to get back on that water. Oklahoma people, we get this. Right? You guys like tornado season. Tornado sirens? Don't go to your basement. Grab your phones. Go get a picture. Right? We're kind of weird like that. And so we understand this principle. But let's look at Luke 840. They've gone back on the lake. They've gone to the other side. And on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. On one side of the lake, Jesus, get out of here. We can't control you, nor can we explain how you're doing what you're doing. On the other side, people are lining the shore, waiting patiently, eagerly. I'm excited. Jesus is coming. Which side of the lake are you on this morning? Or maybe you're right in the middle of the lake. Are you like the people of Gerasenes and you can't explain what's taking place and so Jesus just get out because I'm a bit uncomfortable? Or are you like the disciples in the middle of the sea and it's a storm and you have a lack of faith and Jesus might be looking at you and saying, where is your faith? Donde están tu fe? Where is your faith? He wants to shake you up. Or are you like this people eagerly waiting? They're ready. You see, Jairus is here. Jairus is here. Jairus has a problem. Jairus' daughter is dying. When you have a problem, you know which side of the lake to get on real quick, don't you? I'm waiting on Jesus. I have a 12-year-old son. And if you're a parent in this room, you can relate to this perfectly. I don't know if I could have waited on the shore. I would have been neck deep in the water. In fact, I would have been swimming. Jesus, you've got to come here. My, my, my child is dying. I need you right now. I need you right now, Jesus. So Jesus shows up, and he's coming to this prepared environment. Do you notice that Jesus showed up to both sides of the lake? Jesus always shows up. But the power he can pour out is dependent upon the environment you have brought to the table. We have a prayer team that gets here every Sunday, 8 in the morning, to pray over every single seat. Every single God, let these people encounter you today. Let them encounter you today. And there's intercessors right now in this room praying over you. You're just not aware of it. This is a prepared house, a prepared environment for God to move. Last week I'm in Athens, Texas, and I'm preaching in a church. And I show up on Saturday night to find five or six people gathered right at the front of their stage. They're praying. They said, we meet here every Saturday. And we pray for, they're so proud. They're so happy. They told me, we pray for every single church in Athens. Every single one of them. That's a prepared city. That's a city ready, ready for revival. Those are people that are broken. There wasn't a single pastor in that church. That was just people from the congregation that said, we'll pray for an atmosphere for God to move the next day. What atmosphere are you pulling in your heart for God to move in the next day? My dad asked me, Garrett, how's your quiet time? This was like three or four years ago. Your quiet time, I'm sorry, let me explain. Your quiet time is your personal time with God in the mornings. And I, and I said it's been pretty good. And he said, have you prayed the night before for God to come speak to you in a new way? And I never had done that before. I was preparing an environment for the next morning for God to speak to me. What environment you bring is going to allow him to pour more out into you. What environment do you have? And so Jesus meets Jairus. And Jairus and Jesus, they're walking to his home. His daughter's dying, but on the way, something's about to happen. Many of you know this story, but a woman with an issue of bleeding is there. And she, too, is desperate. And she goes and touches the hem of Jesus' robe. Luke 8, 46. 
Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me. That's all I've got to say. Someone deliberately touched me. Keep in mind, in this moment, Jesus is surrounded by hundreds. He's surrounded. I don't know how many people are here. Let's just say 50. But one of you is going to deliberately touch Jesus today. Jesus says, I'm surrounded by 100, but one person touched me on purpose. One person touched me for a reason. They needed a healing. Who here needs a healing? Somebody needs a breakthrough. Somebody wants a prodigal to come home. And you'll get on your hands and knees and crawl if you have to. Because you are going to deliberately touch the hem of that robe to get what you're desperate for. Don't be like the people of Gerasenes. Jesus, get out of here. Get like the woman. Get like Jairus. Get desperate for what you deserve. Because Jesus paid it all on that cross for his blood to come through and heal you completely. For by his stripes we are healed. This is the word of God. This is not my opinion. This is the absolute truth. I don't base any decision without it. I can't walk a minute without it. I need this every single day, and so do all of us. And so do all of us. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and she fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. In the middle of this moment, someone goes, Jairus, tell Jesus to go home. You're too late, man. Your daughter just died. But when Jesus heard. I don't know what you've been told, but when Jesus heard what's going on with you, I don't care what the doctor said, because when Jesus heard what's going on with you, I don't care what your son said when he called you two nights ago, when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith, and she will be healed. Jesus gets this. He had just lived it. It was the people of Gerasenes that had no faith but full of fear and said, get out of here. It was the disciples on the boat that had a lack of faith. And Jesus says, where's it at? He had just been in both places. And he says, Jairus, if you can have what they didn't, if you can have complete faith, if you can have no fear, I'm coming. I'm coming. Jairus, if you'll wait. Jairus, if you'll wait. Church, if we'll wait. Maybe it's been 12 years. Maybe it's been 12 months. Maybe it's been 12 days. However long it's been, if you'll wait for the Lord, he'll show up. Because he always does. Every single time. He's never late. He's always on point. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He is closer than a brother. He wants to uphold you with his strong hand. He wants to reach down from heaven and rescue you from the mud and the mire. He wants to place your feet on solid ground today. The king of kings is here. I'm here to make you uncomfortable today. Because the word of God never came and made people feel really, really good. He came here to make a shift in their heart, to set them on the right path to advance his kingdom. This is a battle. And I want you on the winning side. And I'm at Gateway Church last week for a pastor's conference. And I felt so confined to my chair in worship. I'm just being honest. I felt confined. Today, when we get back into worship, I don't want you confined by anything. I want to invite you to get to the front of this stage. If you'll be full of faith and walk boldly up here and say, you know what? I want that breakthrough. I'm desperate like Jairus. And so let's see what happens to Jairus. Luke 8, 54. Jesus goes to her home. He takes her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. At that moment, her life returned. At that moment, in an instant, what was dead came back to life. The moment Jesus speaks, so it is. Rebuked the seas, cast out demons, brought the dead back to life. And so today, if you're here and there's a storm brewing in your heart, tell Jesus to speak to it. If there's an unclean spirit on your path, tell Jesus, take it out. Speak to it, God. I need your voice. I need his voice to make a way. If you've got a dead job, if you've got a dead relationship, if you've been given a dead diagnosis, tell the voice of God to thunder upon it today. Everyone stand out of respect for the word of God as I read just what the voice of God sounds like. And as I read this verse, 
if you feel a stirring to get out of your seat, to shake out the place of comfort that we so easily find ourselves in, the altar is open. Jesus, the voice of the Lord is powerful. Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord splits the mighty cedars. The voice of the Lord strikes with bolts of lightning. The voice of the Lord makes the barren wilderness quake. The voice of the Lord twists mighty oaks. The voice of the Lord strips the barren forest. And in his temple, all the people shouted glory. And in his people, all the people shouted glory, glory, glory.
Suneco hold on this moment. There is a Suneco hold on your heart. God's got you held so tightly. He's got a grip on it. Whatever you're going through, he's in control. Whatever you're battling, he has the victory. He has a Suneco hold on you. I just keep seeing the hand of God, and he wants you to know, I've got you, son. I've got you, daughter, for when I speak, so it is. And so don't worry about the waves, because I'm on the boat resting. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. If you're here today and you haven't given your life to Christ and you want to do it in this moment, I don't want to go without extending that. If you're here and you don't know if you've given your life to Christ, just put your hand up. Praise you, Jesus, that we're all here with you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. This is a glimpse of what's coming. This is what's happening. There's a move of God that is going to sweep through this community. And his hand is going to move with unity and with love and with passion. 
and all of you are the vessels to which God is going to use for this moment to spark. It's you. Ask God tonight before you go to bed, let me encounter you tomorrow morning. Yes. Get a spark in your heart. And once you get it, speak it with boldness, declare it. You don't know what you're missing. You've got to get to Lifeway. Yes. Every single seat will be filled. There will be 1,000 people praising the name of Jesus in this place. And it will happen soon. And it is coming quickly. And it's because of all of this. Let's pray this word out. God, I praise your name, Jesus. We glorify you for your goodness. We thank you that you've got a hold on our life, that it doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do. You've got a suneco hold on every single person here. And so I just speak breakthrough, and I speak healing. Jesus, before it's lived in the physical, it's decreed in the spiritual. And so we're making a, a decreement right now, Lord, that you're coming, Jesus, that this revival is sparking, Lord, that the seats will be filled, God. I praise you. We glorify you and continue to equip us so we can adequately describe what's happening in this place. We praise your name and everyone said amen. Woo, you guys have a great week. <laughs> if you haven't got signed up for freedom, get signed up and uh, we'll continue to worship for a moment longer. If you guys want to stay, you can. Other than that, have a great week. Glory, glory.